welcome to Censored. I'm Dr. Aoife Vrithnach. And I'm Dr. Lloyd Maeve Houston. And uh, today we are excitingly joined in a, a first time for this version of the podcast by a very special guest, friend of the show and uh, certainly friend of mine, the author Rob Doyle. Do you want to say hi, Rob? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm, I'm excited to talk about this seminal film. Seminal in, in, in Absol- often quite literal abs- way. <laughs> absolutely in every single way, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to say that I am feeling morally degraded having watched this because yes. it appears that I watched an illegal film in Ireland because it my disc was not certified by the Irish Film Classification Office. Hmm. So, you know, I have, I've been polluted and I'd like to thank you both. <laughs> 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 our 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 very great pleasure um yeah i it's we've we've brought rob in in part because you know i mean the more the merrier especially where, where filth is concerned but this episode emerges i guess out of a conversation that rob and i had a while back where he was expressing his enthusiasm for the the work of abel ferrara who is the one of the creative forces behind this film and off the back of hearing rob describe ferrara's work i thought ah that's that's almost certainly going to have been banned <laughs> in Ireland. And, uh, you know, Julie was was proven right in that intuition. And so, uh, yeah, it's with great kind of gratitude that we, I guess, sort of resume that that chat. I suppose also just something else I might want to do up top is, by way of content noting, unavoidably with this episode, we're going to wind up talking about sexual assault that, you know, is, is sort of central to the plot. We'll try not to kind of dwell on it excessively but it's it's so sort of central to both the themes and the kind of aesthetic execution of the thing that i think it would be Im- impossible not to acknowledge it but but yeah i guess maybe to start us off so the film we're talking about is bad lieutenant from 1992 two, i think and rather maybe than us yammer on about it um rob would you be up to giving us a brief synopsis or maybe a, a sort of overview of your relationship to the film yeah sure so yeah bad lieutenant as you say came out in 1992 directed by abel ferreira who was at that time in his early 40s and had made a name for himself as the director of a series of initially kind of exploitation-y you know, video nasty, underground kind of art sleaze, horror, trash works like Miss 45, which actually had as its star Zoe Lund, who I'm sure we'll get to talk about later, who is the, the co-writer or in, in, in by some readings, the main writer of Bad Lieutenant, a very interesting figure in her own right. Other films like The Driller Killer, I think that was his first kind of feature length film. Apparently, according to the internet, Ferrara's first film was something called Nine Lives of a Wet Pussy, which was, I've, 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 <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen him give interviews about this film, which was a kind of art porn movie that he made, where his own girlfriend at the time was the main kind of female star in this porno. But the actor who he had paid to have sex with his girlfriend couldn't sustain an erection. So Abel Ferreira had to uh, step in and take on the role himself. So this is the kind of artist we're, we're, we're looking at here. Total New York. This is what draws me profoundly to Abel Ferreira as a creative force and as a filmmaker. I'm kind of in love with him. You know, I'd, I'd almost go so far as to say that gradually, incrementally, he's become maybe even my favorite or at least one of my you know, top handful of filmmakers. N- not even to say that he's the greatest, he's the best. You know, his films are always more or less flawed sometimes they're quite bad you know sometimes they just don't work or they're they're all over the place but even when they are they're always interesting but yeah what draws me to him like i was gonna say is he's the living embodiment of a certain type of new york sleaze a pre-giuliani art world sleaze that i just i have always found irresistible you know i think of stuff like the velvet underground and lou reed that was coming out there in the late 70s early 80s and the punk scene out there and the kind of strange overlap between the druggy criminal underworld the avant-garde art scene the punk music no wave scenes and the world of underground filmmaking when it was a bit of a kind of lawless no man's land you know there were cheap rents there was squatting 
everybody was kind of down and out bohemian and there was all sorts of stuff going on and the interesting thing about this film is that aesthetically and morally and in all sorts of ways it in that era better than probably any other film i mean ferrara's own king of new york with christopher walken is another contender for that for that title but it happens just at the cusp when, I can't remember when Rudy Giuliani became mayor of New York, but I think it was like 93 or 94 or something like that. So if I'm correct, a couple of years after this film was released, that happened. And, you know, famously, New York went from being this lawless, disreputable place, which was culturally totally alive, to just another neoliberal, bland, but safe Nowheresville. And, you know, I've, I went to New York this time last year, actually. I was out there for an event and... You know, it's still New York. It will always be New York. It will always be magnificent and enchanting. But that old world is gone, you know. And of course, there was plenty about it that was, you know, probably not very romantic and not very appealing to live through. But seeing it all from the outside, even just aesthetically, it really appeals to me. But I think by this time, Bad Lieutenant, his drug consumption, you know, it was really becoming a problem. He didn't just make films about New York down and out, spiritually inclined drug addicts and losers. He kind of was a drug addict. And I think in this period, he was really into crack cocaine and heroin. And I think he had a few, he kept making movies, but I think through the nineties, he really, he probably hit some kind of prolonged rock bottom in terms of addiction. I'll be interested to hear, you know, what you people think of it. Uh, you, you may come at the film from a whole different angle from me, but part of what I love, one of the many things I love about this film, and I rewatched it yesterday. And for, for I guess, the third time in my life, I, I loved it as much as ever. But what I love about it is inseparable from what draws me to the aesthetic, to the vision of art that he represents, which is its absolute immersion in its own moral turpitude, its own sordidness, its own abjection, and its own kind of unapologetic portrayal of sin and degradation and evil and fallenness and so on. But with something emerging from that, you know, something transcendent, something graceful. And, 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 and actually, Abel Ferreira, what he's doing now, the, the themes that are implicit in these early films, particularly Bad Lieutenant, and we're talking spiritual themes, we're talking the, the oldest, the deepest themes in art, in life, spirituality, redemption, sin, grace, forgiveness, depravity, the religious impulse in the soul of the human species, all of this stuff in these later films that he's made, all of that stuff has come massively to the fore. You know, it's, he's a filmmaker in a, in a spiritual religious tradition, even though he came totally unabashedly from a subcultural porno trash avant-garde, no wave exploitationist milieu. He's, uh, he's kind of a spiritual slash religious filmmaker. Yeah, what really struck me about it that I didn't expect to happen. So I got a really intense wave of nostalgia for film that was so aesthetically grimy and gritty, like just the texture of the image. And it happened when the bad lieutenant is going into a hospital, which is like the least glamorous place you can imagine for film. But we have seen hospitals represented so much, like on television and film. And he walked in, you know, it was all grimy and like yeah. dark and the lighting was shit. And it was just kind of gross looking. I thought, God, you know, that like I kind of I kind of miss looking at that. And there's yeah. something about the crispness of the way its surroundings are lit now where everything is so sharp and the edges are very mm. clean and everything is hard. And I just thought, God, this is kind of. This is kind of sexy in a weirdly yeah. gross way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, 100%. I feel like all of that is condensed in Harvey Keitel and his performance. Oh, like, yeah. talk about a level of, like, ugliness cosmetically, but also morally and spiritually. He gets to moments of anguish that aren't the curated, photogenic anguish of the Oscar-winning performance, but is just, like an utterly incoherent, anguished sort of howl. Like there are four or five points in the film where he kind of makes this like wounded animal sound yeah. in the, both in the depths of his kind of degradation and at, at moments of sort of 
where he nears transcendence or where insight is sort of close at hand that are just like not sounds you ordinarily hear a leading man make. It's... Yeah, I, I, I think this is one of the remarkable facets of the film is the performance that Abel Ferreira has managed to elicit from Harvey Keitel. I always love Harvey Keitel. I think, you know, everything I've seen him in, he's compelling. But in this film, it's his, to me, his absolutely peak all-time performance. But it's one of such uncomfortable, I hate to use an overused word, vulnerability. And it's there in that kind of pre-verbal, animalistic, almost infantile kind of mewling and whining and Mm. whimpering that he does at various scenes and his kind of flurries of curse words directed at Jesus, who he has a vision of, and and at himself and at women and at the world. It's it's as far removed from some kind of pristine soliloquy or monologue as can be imagined. You know, it's him naked, emotionally naked and physically naked, uh, debased, degraded, abject, and yet somehow graceful within all of that. It, it, it did strike me there that when you asked me about the film, I kind of forgot to say what it's about. I wonder, you know, should we do that <laughs> just for just for people who haven't maybe seen the movie? I mean, it's in some ways, it's actually kind of treading ground proximate to some stuff we've looked at recently. We, we did American Gigolo a few weeks ago. Oh, a great movie. Right. But also, I mean, you know, talk about New York scuzz, like Paul Schrader. You know, it, it feels yeah. like if that if that's the sort of 80s LA version of that this is like the 90s, as you say, the most curdled version of New York. Mm. Just before, You're right, the Giuliani, I think, came to office in 94. And then, yeah, this feels as dark as the neo-noir ever got. Essentially, we have our, our titular bad lieutenant who proceeds through an ever-escalating succession of bad wagers on a baseball World Series playoff between the, the Mets and the... The, is it the Dodgers? The Dodgers. the Dodgers. So he he proceeds through a succession of bad bets that take him up to owing something like one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and he's basically told explicitly by his bookie, like, no, 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 the people you're borrowing this from, they are going to find you and end you. They like they will blow up your house, they will kill your family as soon as look at you, and so that is the catalyst for one thread of the plot i guess we've also got the he's one of the crimes that he's investigating and the only one from which he doesn't just steal drugs at the crime (laughs) scene um, is the rape of a of a nun in the midst of a, a church by two young men she refuses to identify them because she has forgiven them and she has this we can maybe talk about that speech where she sort of explicates her her reasoning for doing so and this eventually precipitates a sort of moral apotheosis for him where as as you said rob he he sees a vision of christ Mm. and again one of the most viscerally abject depictions of like just the rockiest of rock bottoms decries him you know says where were you and then eventually has you know a sort of literal come to jesus moment where it turns out that what he's been hallucinating as jesus is actually an old woman who is the wife of the pawn shop owner where a chalice that was stolen in the course of that rape has been pawned, which allows him to find the two young men so he could potentially claim the $50,000 reward that's being offered for their arrest, which would help him clear his, his debts sufficiently to sort of get him out from under this. But he decides, having found these men, to give them the money he's already accumulated from his sort of drug takings give it to them, put them on a bus at Port Authority and send them on their way in the basically certain knowledge that he will be killed. And that's another moment in which he makes that sort of anguished mewling. I I think all that is true, but it should also be said even more succinctly still that the film is essentially a portrait of this guy, this bad lieutenant in a state of absolute moral freefall, you know, and that's mm. like even some of the plot points there for all the three times I've seen the film, the, it, as you listed them there, I kind of realized, wow, I didn't quite pick up on that, you know, it's because I'm taking it on such a, it's such a powerful film on just an immediate visceral visual level, emotional level, it's emotionally raw and so it's almost like the plot just kind of rolls along, you know, you, you realize you're just watching this guy in over his head, getting deeper in over his head and making all the worst decisions at every step along the way, apart from arguably, you know, at the end when he, he does have this great Damascene revelation thing. But it's a man 
in free fall into absolute moral degradation, into drug addiction, into corruption. He's, he's a cop. You know, and again, in light of all that's happened culturally and all of this, you know, mm. uh, movements in the U.S. against police and so on, it's interesting to look at a film that's from the 90s that's so much about a corrupt cop, a profoundly corrupt cop who's kind of the anti-hero of the film. It's crystallized in the opening sequence of the, the film, which it's such a masterly piece of subverting expectations where you have him taking his, his two boys to school oh, yeah. and, you know, doing the sort of like stern but begrudging father thing and then the minute they're they're out of the car yeah, just immediately just doing several bumps of coke yeah. in rapid succession yeah and it's like okay that's the school run for 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 our guy like that this is the the best he's doing in yeah because yeah. he's yeah. actually dressed at that point i mean half the yeah. time his clothes look like he's met them in a corridor and they stuck to him because he's yeah. <laughs> like he's sleeping in random places overnight. He's so oh, yeah. rumpled. And but it's extraordinary how Kaitel plays that like he gets up out of these random places he's been sleeping and he sort of slowly puts himself back together physically. Like he yeah. starts by, you know, putting his hair down a bit. And as he goes through the scene, he actually starts to stand up straighter and the clothes somehow, without him actually adjusting them physically, look like he's dressed. It is the most extraordinary physical performance and the way his face can change from, you know, totally like stoned, fucked expression into, okay, I am becoming like a presentable human being to the world. It's... And just a masterly thing. And like you say, Rob, all you do is just like you can't stop watching him. You're just yeah. so entranced by yeah. what he's doing, even when he's apparently doing nothing or being an absolute arsehole. Well, one of the moments that I, I can't kind of get out of my head is the third major sequence of the film, hard cuts to two women one of whom is is naked you know, and, and it's a sort of pseudo bondage scene oh this crazy scene yeah with this very sort of 1950s sort of sh- it's quite almost sort of lynchian very you know? very lynchian yeah and it, he kind of comes into frame and it, you eventually watch this sort of threesome spool out to the point where he's coke in one hand vodka in the other just sort of mixing and matching until it you have him in a sort of crucified pose completely bollock naked teetering while just kind of making like beep, beep, beep noises. Like you say, it's like pre-verbal or reaching for a fundamental phoneme as he's half weeping and so deep in bafflement at mm. his own kind of condition. And it's it it's astonishing and it doesn't feel like a safe performance yeah, it's a, it's at all. Anything but safe, yeah. But yeah, to, to come back to something Aoife was saying, I think uh, all of that was well said. And to me, that's... It's the look that he has in this film about him that's so inseparable. I can't really imagine anybody else playing the role that he plays in this film and it being the film that it is. You know, it's the look he has in terms of costume, in terms of that kind of disheveled, but somehow incredibly magnetic and even attractive aura of crumpled, rumpled masculinity that he has about him. You know, he's a middle-aged man. You know, he's not, he's not in the first flush of youth and he's got a bit of a paunch. And he's kind of sweating, like druggy kind of sweat half the time. And he's he's never having a good time in any scene, even for all the debauchery. You know, he never has a, a joyful smile on his face. Mm. I think there's one scene of him smiling in the whole film. And it's towards the end when he's really unraveling, trying to double up his bet when he knows he's doomed in the bar. But it's a scary, depraved kind of smile. Most of the time he's... Uh, He's pissed off, you know, and he's kind of put upon and yet getting the job done. You know, he's going about he's going about town. He's running all his errands. He's doing all this cop business, more or less mechanically, kind of indifferently, but doing it nonetheless, you know, ripping off everybody along the way, stealing drugs from the crime scenes and exploiting everyone he meets. But but getting it done. But through it all, it's that magnetism, you know, that sense of not being able to look away from him that raises from being just a potentially you know, sleazy, exploitationist video, nasty to something high art. I I, I saw recently uh, Martin Scorsese called it one of his top 10 films of the 90s, which actually somebody mentioned Paul Schrader earlier. And it strikes me that these three, Paul Schrader, Abel Ferrara and Martin Scorsese, I mean, they're all linked in various kind of career ways, but they're, they're 
they're a kind of triad or triumvirate in the sense that they are all Catholic American filmmakers who deal more or less explicitly with religious and spiritual and Catholic themes in their work, but also with troubled masculinity, violent masculinity, isolated, outsider, dangerous masculinity. No, absolutely. And and it, I, I think even the casting, consciously or unconsciously, reflects that. So Keitel's coming to this just off the back of having done The Last Temptation of, of Christ, oh, yeah. where he plays Judas. Ah. So there's like this, you know, I don't know how conscious that sort of metatextual reach is, but there's this sense of someone on this pseudo as you say partly damasian partly you know what is judas if not a bad lieutenant to christ yeah yeah good gcse film studies for me (laughs) Um, or in a normal christological sort of moment of sacrifice like it's 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 interesting that that keitel is offering an an even like uglier more abject kind of rendering of that that road to sort of his his passion i think is the I think it's the term that Zoe Lunt uses. I read a, a sort of interview with her about that that vampire speech, which is one of the most kind of magnetic moments in the film. And she says that, you know, for her, it was her character recognizing that he's about to undergo his Gethsemane moment and sending him into it with what he needed, which is basically just a fuckload of heroin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and she, she actually shoots him up, doesn't she, in, in the film? And Zoe Lund, mm. who, who, you know, again, wrote the film or co-wrote it and was a kind of long-term collaborator with uh, Abel Ferrara, was more than an unapologetic user of drugs in general, but heroin in particular for her entire adult life. She was a, an impassioned, articulate, zealous advocate of heroin use which is a, it's a rare thing. I, I found a quote by Richard Hell, you know, the punk icon of the New York scene. And he must have known Ferrara and Zoe Lund, but he said, Zoe didn't just love heroin, she believed in heroin. You know, so that scene where she's giving, where she's administering the bad lieutenant a shot of heroin while giving this kind of monologue about the vampires. And I think she's kind of semi-dressed as a, as a bit of a nun herself in that scene. She at least has a kind of Madonna vibe about her. And she was such a radiantly beautiful woman and stuff. It's kind of her putting her near theology of heroin use into kind of aesthetic form in the film. I, I actually have the, I made a note of that speech if we if we want a sort of brief rendering of it. Because, yeah, it has a sort of sacramental quality as she renders it, right? So it's, as she's shooting him up, she's saying, vampires have it easy, they feed on others, we have to feed on ourselves, we have to eat our legs to have the energy to walk, we have to come in order to go, we have to suck ourselves off, we have to eat away at ourselves till there's nothing left but appetite. We have to give and give and give crazy because a gift that makes sense ain't worth it. Jesus said, 70 times 7, They'll never understand why you did it. They'll just forget about you tomorrow, but you got to do it. Wow. And yeah, as, as you say, it is this sort of creed of, of that self-consuming consumption. And yeah, I find it, I find it really interesting that we're talking so much about the religious theological side of the film, because like, that is exactly what the censor objected to. I mean, he said it was <laughs> blasphemous and profane. Uh, oh, did and, he? I, I was wondering about that because yeah. I, I looked at the Wikipedia just for the film and it just briefly, allu- there was actually a subheading that said banned in Ireland. I was like, yeah, you know, um, uh, it makes us seem <laughs> yeah. kind of uh, <laughs> punk in a kind of inverse way. But uh, b- but um, <laughs> it said it, the only quotation it had was the censor banned it on the grounds that it was, quote, demeaning to women or it's demeaning treatment of women. And I thought, wow, you know, if you're going to ban the film, fair enough, because that's the sense of doing their job and serving as the kind of enforcer for a certain moral ideological system that was in power at the time. Um, but it seems to me, if that's the case, they're banning it. They banned it for completely the wrong reasons. Because first of all, because I think it's arguable as to how much it does degrade women any more than it degrades everyone in in the film. But but also because it just didn't seem. 
it ju- it just didn't seem the most provocative thing that the film was doing, frankly, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was after I I I read that on the Wikipedia, and I was like, "Hang on, we got to yeah. get the Bible." So I got out Kevin Rocket's big book on film censorship, and that's that's his quote that it that's okay. what the censor said. So. I'd say Kevin has done his research, so I think we'll go with that. And yeah. the censor, like the one man, he bans. I mean, it makes it makes more blasphemy. sense, doesn't it? That it's that it that is for blasphemy because it's so. It's even to me, if it is a very Catholic film, it is so steeped in flagrantly shocking, provocative, blasphemous images. You know. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I watched the theatrical trailer before I watched the film. And I, you know, I was looking at the trailer, I was like, well, I know why it was banned, like, just straight yeah, away, yeah. because it, it shows the assault in the church, it yeah. shows the statues being knocked over and crucifixes flying, and I'm like, yeah, okay, this is, there's no way an Irish censor is going to be okay with this. I know it's 1993, but yeah. it's still too much, mm. like, it's, as you say, flagrant, and the the board at this time, the Censorship Appeals Board, it has two priests on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, no, I don't know what denomination they are. Yeah. It's not clear. Well, I, I, did, I did a little digging, yeah. So it's, it's still the classic. We've got one Church of Ireland sort of dean, and then we've got a Jesuit. Uh, of course. Who no, else? Ni- neither, both of whom voted in support of, of a, a full ban. Although there were two of the appeals board did vote for an 18s plus hmm. sort of release for it. So including one of the two women on the board, which, you know, again, might somewhat complicate that kind of, you know, it was felt to be demeaning. But, sort but of I mean, blame, but. even kind of above and beyond all that, to me, I mean, first of all, it makes total sense that it was banned, you know, by the mores and by the authorities at the time for, for just the reasons that Eva mentioned. As soon as you see a trailer, you think, yep, you know, of course, the Irish Catholic censors were going to ban it at the same time it's a, a massive and glaring irony because again the more i know i've already said it but the more i watch the film the more uh it's utterly sincere and utterly earnest enactment performance of a christian slash catholic moral truth and moral proposition it becomes more and more obvious you know it's not the imagery and the, the kind of violation of Catholic imagery and so on, that's, that's the provocation. And yeah, of course, if you're going to have a, a, a very painfully graphic scene of a young nun being raped on an altar and, you know, tortured with a, a crucifix or whatever it is, of course, this is going to shock people and of course, it's going to get it banned. But ultimately, you know, there was a lot of more kind of, you might say, brattier art that was around back then you know you can imagine kind of metal bands whose whole thing was just to insult religion to insult the church and all of that kind of thing whereas that's not what this is doing it's actually mm. and you know you read the interviews with zoe lund and lund and also with ferrara and they're very explicit about it somebody mentioned gethsemane earlier and as i was watching it yesterday i realized wow that's the charisma his charisma of damnation that he has throughout the film, you realize as he's doing the rounds in New York, smoking heroin, you know, de- degrading himself more and more with every passing moment, you realize he has that same aura about him that Christ has in Gethsemane, that Jesus has in the hours before he's to be crucified. It's the kind of the aura that comes over somebody about to step over the, the line, you know, to undergo some kind of ordeal, some kind of condemnation, some kind of final agony. And he is damned mm. and he is doomed and it doesn't end well for him. But but like I say, the film, despite the irony is that while they banned it for its blasphemy, it's probably the most explicitly, sincerely and earnestly religious film in its moral worldview, as I can think of from the 1990s, certainly from America, you know, from, from a kind of slightly underground perspective. And even... I mean, even watching it yesterday, that sincerity and that earnestness really kind of touched something in me, you know, so that I'm enjoying it, not just on this level, which I love, as I say, of sleaze and grime and all this stuff we mentioned, but also loving it for its very earnest treatment of these grand ancient themes that increasingly, in fact, draw me to religion in general. And, you know, I used to be so kind of anti-religion, but increasingly I'm seeing so much good in so much to be drawn towards it in its treatment of 
themes of redemption, disgrace, grace, sin, depravity, uh, forgiveness, mm. these huge themes, and it, it, it goes headlong into them, almost with a kind of childlike naivety at times. And so, yeah, it's, it's inevitable and yet ironic that they banned it. No, completely. It, um, it, and in that sense, it actually reminds me, and, and some of its execution reminds me quite strongly of a film we've already talked about on the podcast in this regard, which is Ken Russell's The Devils. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Where it's like, you know, yes, the its its techniques are, as you say, you know, surefire ways to affront a pietistic, socially conservative Catholic culture, but its its conviction to its faith and to the faith it depicts is total in a way that necessitates a non-sanitized version of the abjection it depicts of the, you know, you, you can't have the curated version of this and that there's there's a kind of surreal intensity to the way that the sequence in which the, the nun is raped comes in, it sort of bursts into the film almost like it's from another film. It's, it's mm. you know, it's shot with this sort of jallo-ish red tint mm. and it's, you know, there's all these sort of crash zooms and you've got, in a way that really recalls Russell, you've got the interjection of that shot of a, a screaming Christ, you know, a- actual Jesus. Yeah. And it's, in a way, it, it may, may just be idiosyncratic to me, but what I find really interesting about some of those interjections and it, it sort of recurs later with his, you know, kind of his come to Jesus moment is it's not really clear if Christ is, you know, sort of screaming as commentary on what's occurring or if he's sort of redeeming what's occurred, like the, the, almost the sort of causal temporal relationship between those two moments becomes wrong footed in the way that, you know, a subspecies eternitatis godlike perspective would allow it's, it's, it, you know, it's not clear whether she's suffering in parallel with Christ or mm. if he's redeeming the, the boys as it occurs. I mean, and also her speech about those boys is... Oh, yes. We, you have to do that. Do you have it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's queasy making in the sense that obviously I can completely see how for, you know, particularly uh, for, from a feminist standpoint, ha- having this woman forgive her assailants in this manner is like utterly distasteful or you know i I can see how this would rub people up the wrong way she says those boys those sad raging boys they came to me as the needy do and like many of the needy they were rude like all the needy they took and like all the needy they needed rather i knew them they learn in our school and they play in our schoolyard they are good boys i cannot tell you their names for i too am bound jesus turned water to wine I ought to have turned bitter semen into fertile sperm, hatred to love, and maybe to have saved their souls. They did not love me, but I ought to have loved them. And, like, fuck me. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. got to be one of the most challenging things ever written in a film script. I mean, yeah. I was I was just like, what the hell? Like, when she said it, it was almost unbelievable. But... Also, I mean, forgiveness, unless you're doing it, is almost unbelievable because you're not just forgiving someone for, you know, giving you the finger or cutting you off at the traffic lights. You're forgiving someone for a profound violation. For the unforgivable, yeah, which was the philosopher who said, you know, forgiveness only deserves to be called such if it's forgiving the unforgivable. Even aside from the kind of challenging content of that um monologue or that 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 bit of dialogue it's unbelievable in the fact that when she utters it it's probably the only bit of dialogue in the film that feels so obviously written and it's kind of Mm. grandiose and stagey and stilted Mm. and so formal it almost embarrassingly achingly formal and self-conscious and self-aware and kind of kind of ridiculous even again aside from the content but just in its form kind of ridiculous but again that's part of the film's strange paradoxical tenderness and sweetness and sincerity for me is that it has this kind of dialogue that feels a bit like it was written by an 18 year old or something you know despite that what she's saying is going to be so even offensive or controversial or provocative or something but then also i keep coming back to the fact that this film and this particularly visceral and unforgettable depiction of masculine 
collapse and masculine sin and depravity and degradation uh, was, was written by a woman, you know, by this Zoe Lund. And I, I, I just, I wonder, it's hard to know what, you know, one is projecting onto it or, or whatever, but I wonder if the film's, to me, magnetic tenderness and it's it's just it's endlessly surprising kind of quality whereby there's something so compellingly human even in this vision of of total disgust and depravity and so on is related to the fact that it wasn't you know a man depicting another man it was it, it was it was this woman depicting a a, a, a middle-aged guy you know and probably I don't even know where to go with that or what to say about that. It's just something that leaps out at me. And, you know, knowing about Zoe Lund, that she was in a series of relationships with significantly older men, and she died young. She died when she was 37 of a drug overdose and, you know, clearly troubled but very magnetic individual herself. You know, I've seen her husband has a kind of shrine-like website devoted to her up online where you can read her writings and her unpublished works and see all these photographs of her. So yeah, I guess even the fact that that scene was written by a woman changes it somehow. I don't know mm. how. Mm. It's just, yeah. And, and no, and, and to your point, the, I, the script kind of also tackles that or d does interrogate itself a little bit on that score. You have that sort of moment later where he's like, what gives you the right to forgive them? Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, g given that they may go on to offend again, like mm. what, you know, and she, she offers no sort of answer to that. Well, she all, says, kind of, talk to Jesus, you know, ask Jesus and he, yeah. he'll, he'll tell you, <laughs> yeah. you know, that that's her, the best answer. But, but again, this, this idea of the film's essential religiosity it's uh, mm. it, it brings to mind this idea for me, which as I get older is more and more magnetic and, and appealing of something to do with the mysteriousness of forgiveness and this idea mm. of empathy as an extreme sport or nothing at all or not, or not worth the paper it's printed on. I mean, that sort of trash cinema element to this, I think, is what A, sanctions its, yeah, as, as you say, almost like kind of clumsily or achingly naive kind of moments. I mean, you know, in, in some senses, there is nothing more naive or banal but completely mysterious than sincere faith and grace and th th those moments of redemption i i mean again thinking about lynch it sort of reminds me of like fire walk with me and the angel from that pasteboard like advertisement um that goes absent from the frame and then comes to laura but at the end to sort of lead her out of life and what else is there to have recourse to but that banality almost in, in evoking that it's i think it it's that interplay of the very raw and then sometimes the almost saccharin that is that gives this its kind of particular impact and also that sort of saves it from <laughs> yeah the purely godly saccharin churchly package you know it's not really yeah i think i kind of need it's like some kind of alchemical situation i kind of need both if i'm to really be taken into these 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 grand spiritual questions i need i need a bit of the dirt you know the filth the grime the, mm. i need that new york sleaze bag i need a kind of junkie director saying you know yeah come on let's make <laughs> this trashy porno exploitation movie but then we're gonna go hardcore into the ultimate question i kind of i can't just go to church you know that's just not doesn't work that way for me you know i need my church has to be it has to have a kind of underground no wave kind of aesthetic to it or else i'm i'm, I'm just gonna i'm gonna feel ill at ease yeah. Don't you think that the the grittiness and the, the degradation of the bad lieutenant is also making you ask, like, who is he to judge, you know, any of the perpetrators? Like, it is also asking, in addition to asking, how do you forgive and why? And is that corny or hmm. saccharine? it's then the whole structure of the film is an examination of someone who's set up to be the judge, to be the arm of justice, to be that, you know, professional, objective, you know, conduit for social justice. Mm. Mm. And he's not. I mean, he's so deeply flawed. And so, like, that's, that's the magic. That's how it makes that speech extraordinary, is because of his grotesqueness, yeah. I think. 
it's also one of the defter it, 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 to to credit the the movie when it does have sort of more supple writing. I think it's it's what one of the ironies it sort of plays on in its last legs is you know he eventually comes to the to the nun when she's praying and sort of says, "Look, the other cops they'll find these guys and they'll put them through the system, and you know they're juveniles, so they won't." you know, they'll be out in a few years, this will happen again, I'll give you real justice. Mm. I'll give you the real thing. Which obviously at that point he means like killed him. You know, this yeah. is a man who has who has shot a convenience store, his own radio. Yeah. Like he will <laughs> he will he will shoot anything. But obviously he you know, she tells him to talk to Jesus and and then he does. He finds them he takes them to the bus terminal. He gives them the money and he sends them on, you know, and he has this, again, genuinely really affecting. Like, I, I was sincerely moved. He has this sort of talk with them, te- you know, tears in his own eyes and slapping them and saying, like, you, you're going to get on that bus. And, like, he's so convinced of what he needs them to go away and do. And, you know, I guess in in the film's logic, at the very least, is that him giving them real justice? Like, you know, has he accidentally said something true earlier and and find his way toward it you know yeah yeah ma- yeah i hadn't i hadn't thought of it that way but it's uh, it's an interesting kind of echo back somehow you know that 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 complicates the previous bit of dialogue yeah but but yeah i mean as 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 we said the the final irony is that our censor does not <laughs> does not see any of this yeah. and and it is banned again in 2003 on dvd so Was that it? could be why yeah that could be why my dvd has no badge on it now it dates from 2012 but unless they've resubmitted it since then it may well still be actually prohibited only this time under the video the video act from 1989 so like mm. you know we have the two the two different ways. The final of video things. nasty, almost. <laughs> it <laughs> yeah. is. Yeah. I, I saw. I saw also in online when I was doing a bit of research that the. This isn't about the Irish censorship, but when it was released on video or something in the U.S., the scene where he pulls up the two, you know, teenage girls who are driving, mm. and in a prolonged and graphic scene, what will we say, sexually exploits them so that he doesn't call their dad and get them in trouble. That scene was cut from the video when it was released in the US. And it goes on for about, what, seven or eight excruciating uh, minutes. To me, it's one of the, I kind of, I find that scene remarkable and extraordinary. I think it would be a sin to have that film without that scene in it. Because, yeah. well, just as, first of all, just as cinema, almost, but also it just seems so central to me to the film, to its portrait of him, you know, of him as beyond, seemingly beyond redemption. And yet by the end of the film, we're, we're, we're not going to be completely without redemption for him, even though he doesn't really mm. escape a, 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 a condemned man's fate. It's, it's wonderful cinema. And yeah, 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 yeah. again, I don't know how he elicited such a, in a way, almost a kind of self-damning performance from his leading man because he gets into acting ways that just most actors, their innate sense of vanity or of reserve or reticence would prohibit them from doing. But there's something about Ferrer, but also about his willingness to go there, you know? I guess it's something Mm. to do with Abel Ferreira's investigations of his own turpitude, his own fallenness, his own flawed nature. But he's willing and able to go to these places where most other filmmakers just won't really go. Some kind of rule of tastefulness or something will prohibit them from depicting these things that other filmmakers will move over more quickly or allude to or do it more tastefully or something like that. But in watching that scene where, you know, he's kind of jerking off in front of the car while these two girls are kind of, he's forcing them to perform or to simulate certain sexual acts and so on it kind of you see so much in it you know it's kind of like this donald trump era of masculinity that we're in where there just seems to be a certain i don't know like a certain shameless corrupted masculinity or something like that pushed to its to its extreme it just seems to be encapsulated in that film Mm. Well, to sort of link back, I guess, to, to Zoe Lunt's role in this, it it feels like one of those moments that in some ways only someone who, 
I'm sure in their own lived experience had been subject to that would be able to kind of document or evoke so sort of vividly combined with what Ferreira yeah gets out of like Keitel in terms of the performance like as as you say there's that sense that in other kinds of filmmaking you would allude to or you know heavily imply a moment mm. like this you wouldn't just sit with it full mm. bore and just let it play out yeah minute and, after minute yeah yeah and it's and uh, and it is it's about the duration and it's a you know it's that sense that I suppose if you depict violence that it should be consequential that if you you know you can't just sort of depict a, a malign act and rely on an audience's sense that it is a malign act you actually evoke affectively exactly what it is to endure that or even more unpleasantly in terms of the focalization of the scene to kind of inflict that and not to shy away from that and it's I mean, to your point about Trump as well, I'm sure it's accidental as much as anything, but the bad lieutenant meets his end outside. At the Trump um, Plaza. Plaza. Extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he gets, yeah, takes, takes two shots to the head outside Trump Plaza. And I mean, I feel like probably enough was circulating about Trump that maybe even at that point, that's not wholly accidental, but it's, yeah, grimly prescient. Yeah, and now, yeah. It's now somehow when you... a Trump era film, yeah. And now when, you know, when you have the DVD and you're like flicking through the menu, Trump Tower comes up in the graphics in the background, you know. So uh -huh. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. In the, in oh, the version right. I have, the 2012 one. So you're like, oh, uh, uh, OK, right. <laughs> you're going to make me think this even before I open the film. I just thought that was really <laughs> funny. <laughs> well, I think I think that we've pretty much covered everything. Thank you, Rob. That was wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, Rob. Is there anything you would like to to plug in the the parlance of podcasts? We don't normally do this, but uh, uh, <laughs> we're terrible at plugging. But well, yeah, I was just I would just say buy, buy my books, people. You know, they're good books. I, <laughs> I I put everything I had into my books, so go ahead. <laughs> Um, I, I was going to say, I, was, I suppose also if, if you've been particularly compelled by hearing Rob talk about cinema, it's you've, you've got sort of two recent essays have dealt with different aspects of of that. You've got your, your Gaspar and OA one in, was that in Tolka? And, oh, Tolka, yeah, yeah. yeah and Gasp, your Gasp, winter paper is... Oh, on uh, the conversation, the book, the conversations, the book between... Um, yeah. Walter Murch and Michael Andace, yeah, very interesting. Walter Murch was the editor of films like Apocalypse Now and The Godfather and The English Patient and very, very, kind of polymath as well as all that. But actually, Gaspar Noe, who I wrote an essay about for Tolka, is for me fascinating and compelling as a filmmaker for similar reasons to Abel Ferrara in that he's completely devoted and committed to this sleazy, grimy underworld that we're talked about it's a brutal aesthetic and so on and yet to me there's always this shot of something else coming through and it's some kind of transcendental dimension coming through in his films and it's a yeah it's a combination i'll always be drawn to and in, in art in general amazing well yeah so yeah track those down if you can and and everyone watch bad bad lieutenant please <laughs> Or absolutely don't. Yeah. If intravenous drug use and kind of hideous sexual turpitude and misconduct is not your vibe. I mean, it's a Marmite kind of film, isn't it? You know. <laughs> Marmite feels too, too, too kind of benign a substance to compare this to. It's, it's a heroin film. You either believe in it or, or you, <laughs> or you don't. don't. Yeah.